All right. So what I want to talk about is uh, um, what we have been covering so far. In fact, you've seen me write down this set of equations a little bit um, mid-semester as we were about to introduce Faraday's law. So let me write them down again as a reminder. I have this memorized as a physics major, but you guys might not have them memorized yet. Um, so let me write them down first, and then I'll write down their names. Um, the one regarding the electric field, E dot dA, is uh, you know, integrated over a closed surface. It's the amount of charge enclosed over epsilon naught. And we talked about an analogous version for magnetic field, that if you try to compute this quantity, except for magnetic field, that you get zero. So this is a magnetic flux integrated over a closed surface that it's always equal to zero. Um, what's what I'll write down now? Uh, Ampere's law and Faraday's law. So Ampere's law says that it deals with this magnetic field. It says that instead of calculating the flux, you calculate a line integral, um, B dot DL. And you are calculating this integral around the loop. Now, um, normally you wouldn't do this with the electric field. Because the type of electric field you have seen in static electricity, if you did this, you would get zero. So you wouldn't do that. But with the magnetic field, when you do it, and do it around the closed loop, then you get, uh, then this is equal to mu naught times I enclosed. And we spent a fair amount of time talking about what it means for current to be enclosed. Do you remember? So let me draw this as an example. Suppose I have a current that's uh, going from left to right. Um, so you know it's just an infinite long line of current, I. Um, how would I choose a loop that loop that would be basis of this integral here? How would I choose a loop that somehow encloses this current? Circle around it, okay. So. So you mean the Amperian uh, loop that you will pick would look something look like this. So this loop, for example, can define this. Um, oh, let me not use red. This loop can define this circular um, open surface that has a bound that, that has the loop as its boundary. Yeah? And then what we can say is. Well, what it means for the current to go through the loop is that it goes through this surface. So each time the line goes, pokes through the surface, we count it as being enclosed. So you see that that rules out this as uh, being enclosed in a net sense. Because it pokes through once, and then it pokes back out the other way, so those two cancel out. Whereas this one, it pokes through one way, but the, as it comes around, it doesn't poke through again, so it counts only one way. So, and I think it, uh, the next level of discussion is which we kind of um, skipped the first time we saw it because you know we're gonna come back to this. Um, so this is the question: Is this circular surface the only surface this loop can define, or are there other surfaces? that this same loop can also define, where's my orange? Um, are there any other surfaces that this circular loop can also define that's not this circle? Right? Imagine this uh, circle is being made out of rubber, so you just start stretching it. And I, the example I did during lecture was with a balloon. Right? This uh, uh, opening is the loop, and as I put more air in it, the surface stretches, but it's still bounded by the same opening. 
So here you could uh, imagine this uh, green area being bounded by the loop, or you could imagine something like this being bounded by the loop. Some kind of cylindrical area that you know first stretches out this way, and then has opening here, and then stretches out this way. Right? So there's an actually what seems to be an ambiguity, as in um, as this current comes in. So we are trying to say in trying to define precisely what it means for current to go through. We want to say, well, the moment it goes through the surface is when it's enclosed. But it seems like if we choose this blue loop instead of a blue surface area, instead of this green surface area, then the current actually pokes through here instead of not here. So, so Everyone sees the ambiguity here, ambiguity in choosing different surface, um, sort of surface that's uh, defined by the loop, same loop. So the question here is then, does this ambiguity matter? As in, can you come up with a situation where using this, um, using this surface, you would say your current is enclosed, but using this surface, you would say current is not enclosed. So let's uh, think through a couple examples. So the example that's drawn on the board, it doesn't actually matter which surface you pick, right? The current still pokes through each of these ones. What about um, the, this example that I was looking at, where current comes in, turns around, then goes back up? Um, if, you choose the, if you choose the circle as your surface, then is your net current zero? Still zero, right? Uh, what if uh, you pick something like, so, and you know, if you pick the cylindrical surface with uh, this end being closed, it's still zero, right? Okay, let me try changing the circumstance a little bit. So if I pick this one where the current goes through and then loops around like this, then you have non-zero net current going through. All right, this gives me an idea. What if I do something like this? Like current depends like this. In this case, the net current going through this surface, that's zero, right? It never actually pokes through. What about the net current through this um, cylindrical area? Think through carefully. So there's a positive coming in through this surface, and then what happens? Yeah, it has to live through the side, right? So, so it turns out, so in this case, it's zero. And it turns out, what, um, no matter what kind of example you can think of, the current that comes in has to live somewhere. So it's not as though current can simply disappear because charge is conserved. The, this ambiguity in picking your surface ends up not mattering for the application of Ampere's law. That's why you know, we didn't spend a lot of time on it because uh, this is a, uh, kind of a um, theoretical academic conundrum that turns out doesn't really matter. But we are actually going to come back to this in a little bit today because it's actually consideration of this that leads to one additional law of physics that you haven't, um, you didn't know yet. <laughs> so we'll come back to that in a bit. Um, so, um, so let me pause a little bit here. So we had these three, uh, well, three equations, or really two laws of physics. Um, we had, so we have Gauss's law. Both of these are called Gauss's laws. And we have, um, um, I need enough space here. We have Ampere's law. And I don't know if you guys remember the introduction to Faraday's law. Um, I told you guys that once you know this much of electricity and magnetism, it's like a puzzle piece that's uh, you know 80% complete. You can begin to see the pieces that you don't have, not just the pieces that you have from experiment, 
but pieces that you think you should have, but it's uh, apparent from what you already have that it's missing. That you know, like so when you're doing puzzle, it's uh, like there are pieces that you don't even know that you are missing, and there are pieces that you know are missing because you know you need those pieces to complete a particular area of the puzzle. So Ampere's law was introduced as one of those missing areas, and what I told you then was that there's another missing area here. So, and what, as a reminder, what has helped us reveal these missing areas is looking for consistency with existing laws of nature. So, uh, as a, you know, once again, this is something that we have gone over before, but it's worth saying again. The way you can see that Ampere's, uh, sorry, Faraday's law is missing is that we have such a thing as a motional EMF or motion induced voltage. And what we are going to spend the rest of today talking about is this last piece. So this is a, um, so it turns out the Ampere's law as you know it is incomplete. It's a half of Ampere's law. There's one more term there that no one noticed it until a guy named uh, James Clark Mark Maxwell um, thought that that should be there. That's why we call this entire set of equations, what color should I use? Um, that's why we call this entire set of equations, we call this Maxwell's equations. 